We have spent looking at the introductory section of the Lord's Prayer. Today we actually get into verse 9 of the Lord's Prayer. If you'll remember, the first week we contrasted the prayers of the righteous as opposed to the prayers of the hypocrites. And we said that the prayers of the righteous are primarily concerned with intimacy with the Father, whereas the prayers of the hypocrites are primarily concerned with the praise of man. And then last week, we looked at the words that we say when we pray. We talked about the authenticity of prayer. And we said that God is not as concerned with the words that we use, but rather our hearts as we approach Him in prayer. And we also learned last week that God already knows everything we need before we ask Him. Now, everyone in the room this morning has heard the Lord's Prayer, said the Lord's Prayer, whether it be at a worship service, at a football game, at a funeral. It's a very popular prayer that everyone knows. But this is not a prayer that gives you access to God in any special way as opposed to the next person. For those of you people in the audience that are Disney people, This is not like the fast pass prayer that you can use to get to the front of the line to ensure that God will hear you. That's not why we're studying the Lord's Prayer. If you say it three times a day, it doesn't mean you're a Christian. If you have it memorized, it doesn't mean that when you die you're going to heaven. That's not why Jesus placed it here in this gospel. It is to serve as a template or as a guide as we go to God in prayer. Now remember, the entire section of Scripture that we're looking at flies over the banner of verse 1 of chapter 6. And verse 1 of chapter 6 says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So you take that verse... And Jesus is saying, do not pray like the hypocrites. Do not pray like those who want to be seen, who want to be praised in front of man. But instead, pray like this. And then he begins in verse 9. So as we unpack verse 9 today, we're going to be answering three questions. Number one, who do we pray to? The Father. Number two, Where is he located? In heaven. And then number three, what describes him? Holiness. Who do we pray to the Father? Where is he located in heaven? And what describes him? Holiness. Let's read verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So number one, who do we pray to? The Father. What do we mean when we say God is our Father? Scott Swain wrote an excellent short little book. It's an introduction to the Trinity. And he points out in that book that the fatherhood of God is three things. It's primary, it's unique, and it's transcendent. When we say it's primary... We mean that the entire concept of fatherhood originated with God himself. He is the father over all of his creation. When we say that it's unique, we mean that God's fatherhood is not modeled after earthly fatherhood. Earthly fatherhood is modeled after godly fatherhood. And it's also transcendent. What does that mean? It means God is not temporal. He's not dependent. He's not changing. He's not limited. Instead, He's infinite. He's eternal. And He's immutable, as we talked about last week. Immutable means unchanging. So while we often think of God as a Father, which He is, it's much different from our earthly understanding of Father. Earthly fathers die. They change. They get old. They get perhaps fat. They bald. They turn gray. 
They're dependent on oxygen to breathe, food for nutrients, water to stay hydrated, sleep to stay refreshed and energized. Our Heavenly Father needs none of those things. But he's also described in the New Testament as Abba, which is the Aramaic word often translated as father in English, basically meaning dad or daddy. Dads, generally speaking, provide for their children, care for their children, love their children. But the whole concept of earthly fatherhood reflects a godly concept of father. So the question is, where does this concept of God as father come from in the scriptures? It actually starts back in the book of Exodus. This is the first idea that we get of God being our father. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23 says this, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refused to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. In this passage, Moses speaking to Pharaoh on behalf of Yahweh. That's what happens when you mix those words up. We have the biblical rationale in this passage for calling God Father. Because Yahweh calls Israel his son. So the Lord's Prayer is an opportunity here in verse 9 at the outset to clarify this question. Who is a son or daughter of God? Now we often hear this phrase that I call cringy. It makes me cringe at least. And that is this phrase that we're all God's children. But in reality... Brothers and sisters, we are not all God's children. We have all been created by God, but we do not all belong to God in a new covenant relationship. J.I. Packer, the great theologian who's now passed away, said Jesus' point is not that all men are God's children by nature, but that his committed disciples have been adopted into God's family By grace. So theologically, you are only a child of God today if you have received the gospel by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If that gift has been received through faith, that means that you have been now adopted into a new family. So that's why we celebrate adoption. When couples, or Christian couples especially, pursue adoption, they are reflecting and imitating an even greater adoption that happens when a lost person comes to faith in Christ and God adopts them into his family. Paul illustrates this idea very clearly in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, when he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Paul is teaching the church at Galatia as he's teaching us in these verses that it is not our morality that gets us adopted into the family of God. It is not our family heritage of Christianity that gets us adopted into the family of God. It is not some ritualistic prayer or some ritualistic baptism that gets us adopted into the family of God. We are only adopted as sons or daughters through Jesus, redeeming us to himself by God's grace through faith. Before faith in Christ... We are all enslaved to sin with no hope. Packer goes on to say, As God's adopted children, we are loved no less than is the one whom God called his beloved son. When you are in Christ, you have been adopted into the greatest family that ever existed. 
And because you're his child, because you're his son or daughter, you also become his heir. Paul paints this perfectly in Romans 8, verse 17, when he says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Listen closely. If you are an heir of God, it is better than being an heir to Warren Buffett's estate. It is better than being an heir to Bill Gates' estate. It is better than being an heir to Jeff Bezos' estate. Do we understand what it means to be an heir of God? Those in Christ will one day receive their glorified bodies and be free from the presence of sin forever in the full glory of God. That is what it means to be an heir of God. And this is the Father that we pray to, that Jesus models for his disciples to pray to as he begins this prayer in verse 9. So where is he located? Well, he's located in heaven. We are praying to a divine father who is not of this world. He's God and we are not. You can read various theology books and systematic theologies and when people talk about, is heaven an actual real place? Is it a state of mind? I think the safest approach that we can take is to see how the New Testament talks about heaven. John 14, 2. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Acts 1, 9 through 11. Luke tells us, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then Paul says in Colossians 3.1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now these are just a handful of verses, but I think these verses provide pretty strong evidence that heaven is actually a place as best as we can understand it with our finite minds. But I also affirm, as we must all affirm, that God is spirit and he is not bound in any way by time or space. Knowing that God is not like us, meaning that he is not of this world, should provide great comfort to us. It should humble us to remember that we have limited knowledge and limited understanding. He has full knowledge and full understanding of all things. It should bring us peace to know that every event in this world is orchestrated according to His divine providence. No natural disaster, no military battle ever takes him off guard. But even though he is in heaven, if you're in Christ today, he has left you with his spirit that currently resides in the heart of all believers, the third person of the triune God. Therefore, we don't need to view God as if he is in heaven and it takes billions and billions of years because he's so far away for, his, for our prayers to reach him. No, his spirit is inside of us. He is not aloof from his children. His spirit guides us, directs us, convicts us of sin, illuminates the scriptures to us. The fact that we pray to a God who is in heaven should not be understood to mean that our prayers are going to take forever for, God, for them to reach God. He hears the prayers of his children, as we've said every single week, because of the righteousness of his Son in us through repentance of sin and faith in Christ. 
knowing that God is in heaven and that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God does not mean in any way that God is distant from you and that you cannot approach him in prayer. It's not like you have this relative who lives out in California and you're not that close to that relative because they live so far away and you can only see them a couple of times a year and so you don't know much about him. That's not what we mean when we say God is seated on his throne in heaven. Because the Holy Spirit resides in us, and because of Jesus' death on the cross, we have direct access to God. A direct line to discuss with Him, and lament with Him, and praise Him, and confess sin to Him. Jesus left His Holy Spirit so that his followers did not have to try and figure out on their own how to navigate being a Christian without him. Jesus explains this perfectly in John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18. Here's what he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, Jesus says. I was having a conversation just the other day with an individual who's reading the Bible, and they're frustrated that as they read it, It doesn't seem to make sense to them. They don't feel like they're getting anything out of reading God's Word. That's a common frustration for many people. But first and foremost, we have to understand that if the Holy Spirit is not indwelling in your heart, you will have a hard time understanding what the Scriptures are talking about. How do we know this? Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now what Paul is not saying is that if you have the Holy Spirit, you automatically understand every single passage of Scripture, no questions asked. That's not what he means. But one of the primary ways that the Spirit of God works in us is illuminating to us the Scriptures, helping us to understand what it is that's there. Because as Paul says in this passage, the natural person, the Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 person, does not understand God's Word. Because they are dead in their trespasses and their sins. And when you're dead in your trespasses and sins, God's word doesn't make sense to you until the Holy Spirit awakens within you this desire to want God and to confess sin and to repent of sin. And then suddenly, once the Spirit resides in your heart and you read through the scriptures, He speaks to you. And he shows you things that you would never otherwise understand apart from his presence in you. It's like the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't really understand that Jesus is walking with them. And they explain to Jesus, even though they don't recognize that it's him, everything that had happened in the previous days. And he disappears and he goes away. And the phrase they use is, Did our hearts not burn within us as we were talking with him? The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us understand the scriptures that we read. So brothers and sisters, as we continue to plot our way through this Bible reading plan, just know that if you get frustrated, that's normal. When you get in those really challenging passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah and then into Song of Solomon, the Holy Spirit is there to guide you, direct you, and help you. And there's nothing wrong with using a good commentary in addition to the Holy Spirit to help you understand what it is that you are reading. We all should wrestle with the text, dig deeper into the text, 
seek for answers, but it is the Holy Spirit who provides understanding for us. So as we pray to God the Father who is in heaven, we can simultaneously believe that God is orchestrating all the events of history according to His glorious purposes, while also believing that His Spirit resides in our hearts, guiding and directing us on a daily basis. God is not too busy for you. And then, number three, what describes God in this verse? It's it's holiness. The phrase Jesus uses is hallowed, be your name. We don't use the word hallowed very much in our everyday conversations. But the verb that is used here means to feel reverence for or to honor as holy. That's what that word means. Now in our current in our current climate, even our current religious climate, even our current evangelical climate, we would much rather talk about the attributes of God like love and grace and mercy rather than the holiness of God. But we must always remember that we cannot really pick and choose the attributes of God that we want to believe in and will just ignore the others. That's not how God works. He is fully merciful, fully gracious, fully just, fully holy. We might see different attributes of God described in Scripture and perhaps emphasized in Scripture in different ways. But we cannot take that to mean that a certain attribute doesn't come into God's being until it is referenced in Scripture. He is all of His attributes all of the time. In this particular prayer, Jesus emphasizes the holiness of His Father. God is set apart from us. Here's a definition of holiness for you. The perfection of God in virtue of which He eternally wills and maintains His own moral excellence, abhors sin, and demands purity in His moral creatures. That is a very technical and heavy theological definition of holiness. It comes from Birkhoff's systematic theology. So it is that he eternally wills and maintains his own moral excellence. He abhors sin and he demands purity in his moral creatures. When we approach God in prayer, we are approaching this type of God. A holy God. One who never sinned. And hate sin so much that the only way we could be reconciled to him was that if he sent Jesus to live the perfect life that we could never live. And Jesus lived a perfectly holy life. And yet he died for our sin in our place. So that for any that repent and believe in the gospel... They can be reconciled to a holy God, not through their holiness, not through my holiness, but through Christ's holiness. That is the only way reconciliation to God happens. Through the holiness, through the perfection of God in the flesh, Jesus. We can never do it on our own. Jesus stepped up in the place of sinners. He took on our sin and received the wrath of God which should have been due us for our sinfulness. I've referenced it before which is not going to stop me from referencing it again but R.C. Sproul has written a phenomenal book called The Holiness of God. If you want to read just a whole book that talks about nothing but God's holiness and how we can understand it I recommend that book. Here's what he says. Suppose ten people sin and sin equally. Suppose God punishes five of them 
and is merciful to the other five. Is this injustice? No. In this situation, five people get justice and five people get mercy. No one gets injustice. So if we properly understand the holiness of God, then God punishing sin is never unfair. It's a sign of His justice that flows out of His holiness. He says later in the book, Was it for evil that God... I messed that up. Was it evil for God to impose the death penalty for all sin? If you say yes, be careful. If you say yes, you are saying it is an expression of the very fallen sinful nature that exposes you to the death penalty in the first place. If you say yes, you slander the character of God. If you say yes, you do violence to His holiness. If you say yes, you assail the righteous judge of all the earth. If you say yes, you have never come to grips with what sin is. We must not say yes. We must say no and say it with conviction. When we pray to God, as Jesus models for his disciples, specifically in verse 9, who his Father is, he chooses to emphasize the attribute of God's holiness. God is so holy that when Jesus returns to collect his bride and we are in the presence of God, our only response will be to bow down and worship him in the splendor and glory of his holiness. We cannot fathom what that will be like, but we have enough evidence throughout the scriptures That any time even a glimpse of God appeared in the scriptures, the people fall down and they bow down in worship. Why is that? Because it is in those moments that humanity is made aware of the purity and the holiness of God and they're simultaneously made aware of their own sinfulness. We are people of unclean lips, Isaiah says. And yet in spite of that, through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus for our sin, in our place, as our substitute. I sound like a broken record because I say it every week. We can have relationship with this holy God. We can receive it by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And in spite of our unholiness, We can be made holy because of the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus in us. And how do we know that that's valid? How do we know that believing that is valid? The resurrection proves that it was valid. God was pleased with the sacrifice of his son. And he demonstrated that by showing Jesus risen from the dead. Three days later. So for Christians in the room this morning, the holiness of God is a reminder to celebrate and worship the beautiful gift of Jesus given to us that we did not deserve, that we could never earn or achieve. It leads us to worship. And for the non-Christian, the holiness of God should move you to confess your sin to repent of your sin and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. As R.C. says in his book, everyone in the room needs to know God will execute his justice on sin. That is going to happen. The justice of God, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, it will be poured out on sin. But for those in Christ, they are spared eternal judgment. But from those not in Christ, eternal judgment in hell 
separated from God forever. That is not a myth. That is reality. That is the teaching of Scripture. So when we read this verse, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May we leave in awe of the holiness of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy which you bestow on sinners. We are not worthy of it, but we thank you for Jesus and his sacrificial death. As we leave today, we want to continue to reflect and meditate on your holiness as best as we can with our finite minds. We thank you for your perfection and your purity and your holiness. You are a holy God. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.